You're listening. You're singing. To That Gets My Goat. That Gets My Goat. <laughs> uh, this is Rich Outfield. And this is Big Anglovich. Welcome back. Yeah, we were talking a second ago, literally, <laughs> uh, about writing. And Big was talking about – there's a story he wrote in 2002, a perfectly cromulent story. But he doesn't want to send it out because – we'll tell, tell everybody – well, I was just thinking that, you know, in those days, I don't know that I was that good of a writer. So I'm afraid that the story, maybe that's me once again, self-rejecting, but I'm not sure if, if I've got stories from that long ago that I want to send out or not. I don't know when it comes down to it. I think those are the stories that you know best from me. Those are the ones that you probably remember more than others, like the baby monitor story, for example, I think I wrote in 2002 and I had a few others that I wrote in like 99 I don't know if uh, those are good enough to send out or not, but I think we used one of them for our uh, incentive episode. So Maybe it was an anniversary show where we did a story by you and a story by me, and then we talked. Well, there was one that you did a special recording of before we ever started the show, and then when we started the show, we, we would give it to people when they donated. Oh, okay. And uh, so it was sort of an incentive episode before we ever started doing incentive episodes. Cool. So there are a lot of people who have heard the voices. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was one I wrote in 1999. Kill your family. And uh, did, Wait, did you hear the speaking of voices? <laughs> See, that's something that writers have been saying for years. And we've heard it for years. So you know, who knows who first said it and how long ago that was. But writers say that you, as a prospective writer have X number of thousand words of crap in you. Uh And as soon as you get that crap, for lack of a better word, out of your system, the sooner you can start writing stuff that's really good. Uh, Did did I phrase that correctly? Is that understandable the way I said it? I think so. Although when it comes down to it, I would say it's not quite the same as that. It's more that it will take that many thousands of words for you to learn to not write crap, I think, is uh, maybe a better way to put it than just getting the crap out of you. You just need to sit down on the toilet and squeeze off all that crap, all 100,000 words. But I think I've heard it phrased exactly that way. It might, they might not even have said crap. They go a step further, so there's no question what they're talking about. And they say, dung. What's brown and sounds like a bell? Dung. You know, I've, I've heard that said, and, and my guess is that a lot of people agree with that. And I, I don't know that everybody agrees with that because you can make a statement like the sky is up and somebody somewhere will take issue with that. But, for example, I, you and I used to read a lot of Orson Scott Card. Mm-hmm. And I know that his first two or three novels are out of print by choice. Like his publisher would still like to make money off of these novels, but Card has said, no, I'm ashamed of these three <laughs> books, right? I, I'm, I'm not making this up. Yeah, one of them he rewrote, didn't he? A Planet Called Treason, he rewrote later, and it's yeah. just called Treason now. But there's a couple that he's allowed to go out of print because he's embarrassed, frankly, by these books. You know, they're, 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 he's gotten so much better. That, you know, he doesn't want people to read this, these books when he was still learning or whatever. But I read one of those books and it was good stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, what? seriously, he discounts this book. He dislikes this book so much. He doesn't want anybody else to ever read it. And then you and I read a 21st century Orson Scott Card book. We both read it around mm-hmm. the same time and hated it. I hated it. And you hated it as well or or didn't appreciate it or disliked it or whatever the politically correct term is. I mean, I still really like Card as a writer, uh-huh. but this book did not do it for me. And I yeah. know it didn't yeah, do it for it you. It didn't speak to me at all. How do we explain this? If you've got the X number of, of words of crap in you, you get them out of, the, out of your system. Stephen King's first few books are like butter. They're so friggin' brilliant. And the stuff he writes today is not up there with The Stand, with The Shining, with Carrie, for God's sake. How do you explain that? And now part of it is maybe his sensibilities have changed or he had these great stories that he wanted to get out. And once he got them out, he's like, oh, what do I do now? I don't know. I don't know what the explanation is. I would hate to read a story by me 
20 years from now and be like, oh my gosh, what have I become? My sweetest friend. You have become that which you most despise. Everything I know goes away in the end. Good night, folks. Well, no, no, no. I've, I've just been <laughs> rambling. Can we talk about that? Sure. What are your thoughts? I don't know. I think a lot of it may have to do with you can get like a lot of authors, some like a Stephen King or Orson Cut card. You could easily make the case for the fact that they have grown to be in love with themselves so much that they don't want to be edited anymore. You know, they don't want the editor to say, hey, you need to scale this back or cut that down or something like that. Or maybe they've gotten so full of themselves that they love to hear themselves speak. I've often talked about the difference between Ender's Game and Ender's Shadow, which is supposed to be the same story told from a different point of view. And yet somehow it's like a hundred pages longer from this other point of view. How does that happen? Why is it so much more obese at that uh, later stage in his career? Those later shadow books became morbidly obese too. <laughs> I don't know what it is that, that causes it. Uh, and it seems like that kind of stuff happens a lot to authors who become bestsellers. It seems like maybe they get full of themselves, you know? They're, they're the greatest, and so they're going to write what they want, and they're going to make it as long as they want, and they think their stuff is great. So even if it's not, they're going to write tons of it, and it's going to get big, and it's going to get hard to wade through. Because nobody tells them no, and, and, and a person, an artist, needs to be told no. Sometimes, I think, but I'm sure there are people that would disagree with you. I was just listening to... Not about the Stephen King thing. Stephen <laughs> King is the only person that would disagree with. <laughs> I was just listening to Stardust by Neil Gaiman, and at the end of Stardust, Gaiman was talking about how he likes listening to audiobooks when he goes on long trips, and he said he had to drive from Florida to Minneapolis at one point. M Minneapolis, Louisiana, yeah. Right. So he got himself a bunch of Stephen King audiobooks to listen to on the way, and he said it was just so great to listen to Bag of Bones on his drive across the country. And I know that you have said a Bag of Bones is horribly bloated and, oh, so way too long, and it needed to be edited down extremely. Yet Neil Gaiman thought it was great. So I don't know. I mean, they're, they're I guess, are different tastes. And uh, maybe the older you get, the more you care about certain things as opposed to other things. Uh, I remember one time Orson Scott Card somewhere was talking about, you know, how he would do something differently now that he's where he is as a writer instead of where he was 20 years ago. And he says, you know, these days he's much more into the characters. And so he would get more in depth on the characters and stuff like that. Whereas before it seemed like maybe he had more of a plot driven story I don't know. I'm not sure what the what the difference is. What do you think? Well, gee, I, I don't know. Because I've been a fan of Stephen King since I was old enough to read a Stephen King book. And so he's the author I'm closest to and I have followed his career the most and, and know the most about. And I know that it's bugged him his whole life when people say, Dead Zone was the best book that you ever wrote. But, oh, the Stand is my favorite book ever. And, and a lot of people say that. The Stand is easily his best book. Uh -huh. But that bothers him because that was now more than 30 years ago. And he's still writing books. And nobody says, Black House is my favorite of your books. Or A Duma Key is my favorite book that you've ever written. And you know what? Somebody somewhere may because that speaks to them. But except for Under the Dome, none of his modern books have spoken to me the way that his older books have. And I, as I was reading Under the Dome, I was like, wow, this, this feels the way I felt reading his old, old book, reading Firestarter, reading Pet Cemetery, reading uh, Salem's Lot. Wow, this is just, uh, this is totally like the pre-accident Stephen King. How, how did this happen? And then when I got to the afterward, or maybe it was an interview with him where he's like, this is an abandoned novel that I started to write in like 1977. And I was like, oh. And it bummed me out. He wasn't back, actually. It was something from back then. It was like that scene in Spider-Man where he's like, woohoo, I'm back, I'm back. And then he shoots, goes to shoot his web and it doesn't work and he falls and then he's like, oh, 
my back. Spider-Man 2. Yeah, that's what I... I was hoping that you could understand what I was... Well, it's, I, I don't know how to equate it to something else unless, uh, you know, like... Well, you could talk about a uh, film director, for example, like Steven Spielberg. Yeah, Spielberg. 30 said, years ago, he had amazing films and everybody loved it. And more recently, not as much. But, and yeah, like he... Uh, they made a big deal when they released Close Encounters on DVD because it included like some of the stuff that had been cut out all those years ago and and it removed the stuff that the studio said you have to put in there for us to give you the money to shoot this special edition thing. Um, so it was kind of like the version of Close Encounters that he wanted. But one thing that really bothered me that he said at the time was, I wouldn't make this movie now. It's like the 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 man I was when I made Close Encounters is not who I am now. I would never have a man become obsessed with something and leave, abandon his family the way that Richard Dreyfuss's character does. And I mean, it's just ick. And and the 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 apology that he made for it, and then later the apologies that he and Lucas made for Temple of Doom. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, George and I were both going through divorce at the same time. We were in a really dark place, so we made this shitty movie. And I was just like, how dare you apologize for a movie that I love? Apologize for friggin' Hook, man. And uh, a lot of people really responded to Close Encounters. And it was on TV the other day. And all of us just, like, put everything down and started watching even though it's boring as hell. I mean, sorry. Uh, even though... Uh, I agree with you. I'm sorry. I, I was never a fan of Close Encounters. I didn't see it until I was in college. And when I saw it, I was just like, huh, because I don't get it. I, I guess I, I had to be there. I don't know. I, uh, Chris Claremont was this X-Men writer that worked on the, the book for like 19 years. And toward the end of his career, when, when he was sort of forced out of doing the X-Men, he had gotten this superstar artist named Jim Lee, who was an up-and-comer and the best artist comic books have ever seen. And they paired him up because X-Men was the number one title. And it was like, like, let's get this great artist on there. And Jim Lee loved the X-Men from when he was a kid. And he would say, oh, do you remember when you did this story about the Shi'ar? And you remember when you did Days of Future Past? And remember when you did this? And he'd be like, I want to do that story again. And I want to talk about this. And Chris Claremont was like, no, I don't want to go back and revisit any of that stuff. I don't want to write about the fucking Shi'ar anymore. And, that, and eventually he's just like, I'm done. And he quit, and he never was able to get back what he had. And, you know, he's, he's, he's looked back ever since and been like, why did I, you know, kind of thing. And, and, and you know, he either quit or he was forced out. It you know, depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. But I guess I can understand that with a writer where it's just like, I don't want to tell those stories that I told when I was a teenager. I don't want to tell about a, a boy protagonist or whatever. I want it to be a 60-year-old protagonist now. Or that, that story that I told when I was 25 was a, a recurring dream that I had as a teenager. And I don't have any recurring dreams left over from that time period. I've written them all. Right. It's like whatever I write now is some idea that comes to me now. Because, you know, after writing professionally and your publisher expecting you to do two books a year or a book a year, you run out of these stories that you've always wanted to tell. Right. I mean, and this is, that's just my guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's something that has worried me sometimes. I remember thinking that uh, a few years back where I was like, I got lots of ideas for stories when I was really young. When I was a teenager, when I was a young 20-year-old. Middle-aged 20-year-old uh, right. in your case. I got, it seemed like a lot of ideas. I would get like one or two or three really good ideas. At least I considered them really good ideas a month. Then about the time I was turning 30, I was driving to work one day and I was thinking, you know, I, can, I don't know if I can even remember the last time I got a good idea that I thought, oh, that's a great idea. I need to write that story. And I wondered what the deal was. Was it because I don't write those stories that I have already? And so the idea gods have said, hey, no, not until you eat what's on your plate. Then, no, then you can have... You ought to write a story have, about that. that. I did, actually. I, I, that's a joke. <laughs> I, I'm remembering the story you wrote about. That. Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what the deal was, but it actually kind of worried me a little bit. Where do the ideas come from and... Why have they stopped? Yeah, why are they not coming as fast and furious as they used to? Did you come up with an answer to that? Or is that one of those questions you'll never know? Well, I don't to? think that I ever will know. My answer to it was that if I wrote the ideas that I had, 
then maybe new ideas would come. So I needed to get my button gear if I wanted more ideas, you know. Why am I complaining that I'm not getting more ideas when I don't write the ones that I have anyway? So who cares? Well, about three months ago, we had a conversation about J.K. Rowling. And gosh, I'd love to sit down with her and just talk to her and say, you know what? We won't even talk about Harry Potter. Let's talk about other things. Um, How terrifying would it be if she has hit that point? And she's like, I'm never going to write anything like that again, that people are going to love, that people that are going to change people's lives. What if I've lost it? What if I've lost the magic and all that stuff? And, And granted, she has a cushion which is a billion dollars. Right. She doesn't but, need to write anything if she doesn't want to. But the fear of what if I've lost the magic or what if I'm not what I once was? What if I can't catch lightning in a bottle again? That's got to be very real. And that's something that anyone who's succeeded would have to ask themselves. That, that my guess. Unless you're the kind of person who can just rest on your laurels and say... I've made X number of dollars. I have a a best-selling book. There are people out there who are famous writers who never wrote another book. Right. But I'm not one of those people, you know. I I start to feel worthless again 10 minutes after completing something. And I don't know where the ideas come from or why they stop or why they start again. But, you know, something that as we get older... You start to discover options of ways that I could tell this story and things. And so, you know, what maybe Stephen King still has as wonderful and inspiring ideas as he had when he was a teenager. But now he tells it in a different way. He's like, well, okay, how do I stretch this to 700 pages? (laughs) Which yeah, sounds like criticism and all that, but it's just like his focus is on something else. Uh, How does somebody like him challenge himself? Maybe he doesn't challenge himself. Maybe you take the easy way out and you get something really mediocre. I don't know. If he tried to write something like he wrote when he was 20, could he do it? And would he want to try? And, and that, that's something I don't know the answer in that. And, and, you know, you can't really know. Although you have written more than one story with the same idea, right? You wrote a story when you were a teenager now you're an old man and you're like, I'm going to write that same story again. I and did do that. And the story comes out differently because your techniques have changed, your life experience has changed, and your priorities have changed. You wrote this story. It's our second incentive episode about uh, the world has ended and there's an old guy who goes up and maintains like the gardens and stuff of, of us trying to rebuild the world up there. And maybe... As a teenager, you were all about what the world was like and what his memories were like or what the aliens are like, the monsters and all that stuff. And now it's like, okay, what is an old man's life? What is a a life filled with regret? What is an old man who's never been able to experience life on the surface think about and stuff? And and, and as you get older, your your attitude would change even more. And you'd be like, okay, well, I'm 60 now. I know what an old man thinks and all that, you know, stuff like that. To be continued. That Gids My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license for some reason.